Poplar joins with other friends and colleagues to pay tribute to Terry Williams, the wizard from Swansea, who is obviously rather more than just the drummer in the band. It made quite a difference to the band when he came in. They sort of moved up into being a much more powerful unit. That's the way you do it. Get it gets on the TV. That ain't a working. That's when he hits the kit, it's very deceptive. It doesn't look as though it's being hit hard. But if you get up there and you whack you whack your snare drum as hard as I mean you could you could really smack it and um, you wouldn't get anything like the level because he whips it. When he starts playing, you get this rush of power. It's sort of like Concord taking off. It sort of just just sort of comes at you. And you sort of hang on then. It's like Ben-Hur's chariot, you know, sort of racing around. You're hanging on for grim death. <laughs> I've lived in Swansea all my life. Like with man, we lived in Germany for a while. I lived in New York for a while. It's just when you're away on tour, really. But I've always, this is my route, really. It's good to be able to come home to Swansea. My family are here, my friends. You know, it's just a nice place to be. For me, there's everything that I could want in Swansea. Right, 10 pence, there we go. Come here. Some great local musicians that I play with. The odd gig in a pub or club, I really enjoy it. I mean, I just love playing. Obviously, there there are an element of people who just come to see Terry because of the dire straits things, but. Um, and most of the time they, they come to see the band. He gets a lot of um, autograph handers, people um, wanting to spend a few minutes with him. Um, people like to take a photograph with him. People have come out to Terry and said, uh, oh, why isn't it called the Terry Williams Band? Because you, you were in dire straits and very famous. And Terry's answer would be, well, I'm just a drummer in the band. Everyone's got a sense of rhythm. They've just got to know how to use it, really. Just got to keep the time. I mean, not everyone's got to. You see some people on television kind of trying to keep time with a record. Or, I mean, if, I, if some kids ask me anything about, dan about drums, the first thing I ask them to do is to dance. Because if they can dance, they can play the drums. I mean, I don't mean, you know, pirouette across the uh, pavement. Um, in the control room, you know, they say, Terry, can we just hear the snare drum again? So you kind of go. And Tina came up in front of me. She's got incredible energy. So she started with her, you know, going like this with her feet. So I started going. 
you know, and I was speeding up and she was going with me and screaming at me and she's going, yeah, yeah, and I'm going, we're going like mad. And I think I give in. I couldn't give it up and Tina was still going. Swansea was a great place to grow up. One thing I always wanted as a kid was one of these beach huts in Langland Bay. Now, years later, I finally got one. This is the beach hut, Langland Bay, our little hut on the beach. Not exactly the south of France or anything, but it's our little hut. I prefer to come down here out of season. There's not too many people and, you know, it's just nice and you can relax, get away from the rest of the world. We used to live just over the hill, so I was down here all the time when I was a kid, messing about on the beach. My parents never stopped me or my brother doing anything that we wanted to do. They just, you know, if that's what you want to do, it's up to you. When he was four and a half, the school sent for me, that was all, and they told me that Terry was walking very bad limp, and I had to have him put in a plaster case for five years, with colour pads on, you know, after. The weight of the plaster on my legs balanced up the weight of my upper torso. Then I could put one hand between my legs there and just balance on it, you know, it just rocked me. And then I'd run across the room on my hands. Sounds so stupid now that I think about it. Stupid, it goes so fast, tear across the room. Split second. Very powerful arms he had. Get the knives and forks when I'd be laying the table so I'd be hitting everything. Sugar, knives, for you know. Hitting it a lot. All the cups, teapot. You mention it. I used to get so cross because I couldn't stand that part of it. But um, we should have really known then that you'd be a drummer. My dad influenced me in the fact that there was music in the house 24 hours a day. Um, through his jazz stuff and his big bands and he used to listen to a lot of American music. Um, and it was literally right until the early hours of the morning. Our house was a rocking little house. Um, so I suppose I'd, it was just a natural um, thing that I would become a musician, uh, a drummer, sorry. I had gone to uh, the MC Ballroom in Swansea to set up the stage ready for the night's um, dance and I took Terry with me and I had a little tinkle on the piano and the next thing I knew somebody was playing drums and it was Terry. Um, not bad at all. So uh, obviously the wish to play was, was there with him and um, he felt that he, he, he wanted to be a musician and talked me into buying him a kit of drums for Christmas. The first thing I ever played on the drums was a Fax Domino track called Hello Josephine. It was Christmas morning, I had to wait about four or five hours for my parents so there was a note on the drums do not play until your father gets up. So I had to wait. And, and it was a simple thing, it was just a kind of... <laughs> That's all it was, because I think I'll come back to those later. You know, Boxing Day, I'll get under the symbol. <laughs> No idea why I wanted to play the drums. Um, I think it was the only thing I could do. And, and at that time, in the early 60s, everybody wanted to be a Beatle, wanted to be a, from Liverpool or whatever, you know, just wanted to be in, in groups. And it, I just happened to be able to play the drums. Other occupations worked in a slaughterhouse. Was a carpenter, an ophthalmic technician employed by Mickey. Stop breaking glasses. 
You didn't do that, did you? Musical influence, Beatles, rock and roll. 18 months of the common shows, joined the Jets, two years later with the Dream, Love Sculpture, joined Man. Did I have a lot more since then? In the 60s and 70s, um, there were so many rock bands, or play well, beat combos they were called then. That was the great term. I love the term beat combo. Um, there were more in Swansea than there were in Liverpool or Manchester or anything like that. We were listening to their music, not realizing that they were as good, if not better than, a lot of them. <laughs> the Ivies? The Ivies. The bystanders, or which became man without hair, though. Ah, there you go. Are you the very Jets. Youth, very youthful looking terrible. I joined the Jets because I liked the name and they changed their name to the Smokeless Zone. Because none of them smoked. Haircut. He shaved his head. Yeah. You've got all this documented well. Oh, this is a great one. Are you actually like Tommy Steele? I did there. at the time. That's because I had blonde hair. My grandmother used to call him Tommy Tin. <laughs> Man just phoned me up. You know, kind of they said that they were going to change their music. They were changing their music and they, their drummer and their bass player. Would I like to join? And it was just a natural thing to do. I mean, they were all mates. They were all friends from Swansea you know that. And we were the epitome of your hippie band. <laughs> Man weren't commercially successful because we wouldn't pander to the big business, we wouldn't put a single out. But they were popular. I mean it's a very popular band. Well after Man split up, it was about five days later. I bumped into Dave Edmonds at a party and he was writing with Nick Lowe and he knew man was splitting and it was just like a logical thing to do, let's let's put a band together. And so we formed Rockpile, done a couple of albums, Nick Lowe's Rockpile, tour America with Nick Lowe's Rockpile. Two, three months later we tour America with Dave Edmonds' Rockpile, whoever had the record out, different record companies. Trappings and trophies of the music business. This is Girls Talk. That was my first silver disc. Uh, Dave Edmonds, Girls Talk. This is Money for Nothing, off the Brothers in Arms album, the first one. And why these are here is the fact that I don't like to see gold albums on show. You know, kind of just somebody walks into a rock star's, pop star's house, and there's the latest gold album. I don't like all that stuff, so I try to hide them. They're for me, they are. This one's uh, Walk of Life, and another one off Brothers in Arms. Uh, just a couple of months after that, and I think that's a hold. But this is where I really keep all that kind of stuff, you know, in this room here. Yeah. I keep all this sort of stuff, really, because I mean, it's, it's obviously been my life for the last 27 years or whatever. It has special memories, because every time you look at something, it reminds you of that time. I mean, I don't live in the past. Living in Swansea, I think, is quite good because Terry doesn't get hassled that much because we tend to go to the same places and people don't bother him so much then. He's very loyal to his family. He loves his family. My family keep me well, you know. 
I can't get away with anything with them. They really keep my feet on the ground. You know, kind of whatever I want. If I want to get a bit kind of, you know, pop star or whatever, uh, they're the first ones to knock me down. It can get difficult on times. Um, the children miss him. Reese more than Danny, because she's always been used to him being away from the day she was born. And if things go wrong, it gets difficult. But myself, I quite like the space of him being away, and it's nice when he comes home then. Jerusalem. I had an experience there, which was, um, I think it was the first time I realised, no, I realised I was in a very popular group, because it was the, the first gig of the world tour. And I think we were the first band ever to play Israel at that level. And we'd done press conferences and things like that. And we were told, you know, not to go out because, you know, you could get mauled and... And I didn't believe it, because, I mean, I've always... I've stood down the front of the stage at some Dyer Straits gigs and nobody knew who the hell I was, because they don't recognise... Well, they didn't recognise the drummer. So I just kind of walked through the lobby of the hotel, no one took any notice of me. Walked out, walked about 100 yards, 150, suddenly noticed there's about four people behind me, kind of getting closer, then eight and 16, then it's like getting bigger and bigger. And I'm speeding up a bit and so are they. And all of a sudden from nowhere, these four guys came who were the security. And they just said, okay, Terry, I think it's time we went back to the hotel. Um, and it was like the first time I suddenly realized that, hey, hang on, I mean, this group's a bit popular. Well, he came to the house to, uh, one day and said, uh, Hi, Mum, Dad, I got a surprise for you. So we thought, oh, what's this? He said, you've got a trip to America. He said, to New York. We, we'll be playing there with Dire Straits and a couple of concerts that you can come to. Stay in one of the best hotels and have a couple of weeks, all expenses paid. Oh, yes, it was a wonderful experience. Oh, wonderful. It was the atmosphere, all the lights dim. It's such a terrific roar as the band were coming out. And the whistling continued for about five minutes. And then the band, and of course the first one to play was Terry. Just boom, boom. Once I heard that, oh, it's gone. I just had to run out. I was so emotionally upset, really. Because I was so proud of him, being up there. Some people obviously get nervous. I don't. I mean, you're going to walk out in front of 80, 90,000 people. Um, and it is such a buzz. It's hard to explain. Um, it's just exciting. It is very, very exciting. And plus with the streets, you know that the guys around you, you're a team. So there's no reason to be nervous because no one's going to let you down. It was after we stopped touring. And we'd been laid off for I don't know how long as a band, really. And we came back and did the, uh, the Nelson Mandela thing. He came back and played better. I mean, we did a couple of warm-ups at the Hammersmith Audio and then went off to Wembley. And yeah, he played great. He played just great. The Mandela concept was just 
just wonderful. And plus we had Eric Clapton playing with us, which is something I'd always wanted to do. Um, it was just something we felt really strongly about. Um, so, and we were one of the first groups to be asked, along with Simple Minds, and we jumped at it. <laughs> to all get back together and play at an event like that. That's what was pretty special for me as well. I think it's important to put something back into the community, and I'm in the position to do it. I give certain albums away, gold albums, platinum albums, if it can raise money. I give a platinum album to Swansea City when they nearly went broke. Um, I just lend my name to any kind of cause, which I think is, you know, worthwhile for the community. I hate to see kids sitting on street corners, drinking special brew or sniffing glue or whatever they do. I mean, my daughter's a channel herself in the dance, and she's happy. We have this idea of um, like a sort of center for the teenagers between the age of 14 to 18 or something for them to channel their energies in music, drama, the arts. Um, really, that's what I'd like to see, something happening in Swansea. And basically trying to get together a facility which would offer resources to young people. That would be expertise, equipment, space, so that they could have opportunities for training, for classes, just for informal enjoyment and so on. I must admit we concentrate significantly on the younger people and some of the elderly. There is a need in the teenage population. I think what I would really need is something from you in more detail in the way of a, of a plan. My officers with this, some expertise could work. Over the years, he's mellowed out a bit, but he hasn't changed a lot. I think living in Swansea have kept his feet firmly on the ground. I think if he lived elsewhere, he might have gone to his head a bit, but living in Swansea keeps him down to earth. The quiz in the badminton on a Sunday is, uh, it's just good fun. There's a man with his hand up already, I hope you're enjoying it. The money that's collected um, for a wrong answer, you know, the five pences, that goes into the jar and at some deserving cause on Christmas, old age pensions and something like that, around the area, Christmas hampers. Um, and the idea is to get the questions wrong, you know, and be funny, with your answers and things like that. I'm sure a lot of you went to this country, and it's something that is worn in this particular country. Handcuffs. Handcuffs. <laughs> the 60s question again. What was unusual about the group, the Joy Strings? <laughs> the Joy Strings. First hand up, T.W. Salvation Army. Salvation Army. Right. It's for a half pint ticket. The biggest selling album in the United Kingdom with over 15 million sales was... Brothers in Arms. Brothers in Arms. Oh. Oh, 
always had a strong Welsh contingent in the crew of the band, uh, and um, Terry knew them all, obviously, because they're all from the same part of the world. They've all been involved in music for a long time, and I think the crew were very happy to to have Terry in as well. And, and uh, it sounds a bit sugary, but in fact, I think they were very proud that he was in the group. what it means to me um, to be Welsh is because you only realise it when you're away um, if you're especially if we're doing big concerts or something Mark says is the wild Welshman on drums or something you know and you see the, the banners go up in the crowd or sometimes the Welsh flag or Swansea boys or something like that I think it's, a, it's great that he still lives down there I mean we certainly don't want him up in London uh, no, I think, you, you know, it's best if, you, if you've got roots and uh, there's a very active music scene in South Wales and has been always. No, I mean, it's, and it, I don't think it affects his, him professionally. You know, he's not uh, losing out because he's down, down in Swansea. And I think, it, it, I think with anybody who's in a major public situation, doesn't matter whether it's music or anything, it's good to have a base that you can go back to where people will treat you just the way that you've always been treated and not sort of as you know, a member of Dire Straits or whatever it happens to be. I'm not the sort of bloke with a great philosophy of life. I just take it as it comes. I plan it day by day. I mean, obviously, I know what I'm going to do in a few days' time or a couple of weeks' time. But I go by day by day. I've got no great plan. Oh, this is a good time. Yeah.